So this lecture is the beginning of chapter three of the Gaskell textbook. And I think it's, uh, well, the few sections at the very beginning of this chapter are quite confusing. Not because, well, for several reasons. One is because the concepts are, are, are challenging, but also because handling the, the math and the sign in the math is challenging. And it's something that when you read it and you start trying to write out the equations, it's really easy to get it wrong. I know because I've gotten it wrong several times in the process of writing them out. But I, I think I've, I've got for you a good demonstration of how the, uh, the entropy in, in this, uh, I guess, ideal system, this first uh, small system that Gaskell describes uh, works. Uh, it's, I think, fairly important that you read these sections on your own and try to sit down and, and write out how the math works. Uh, because seeing this is really going to help you with some of the more abstract concepts associated with, with entropy. And that is the, the topic of this chapter. This chapter is about entropy. And the, and the second law of thermodynamics. And the way that we introduce entropy is simply to describe it uh, in terms of uh, spontaneous processes and irreversible processes. So uh, spontaneous process or a transformation uh, occurs without uh, an external agent. I mean, it's, it's something that just goes on its own. And we've all had experiences with that. You know, pencils falling on the floor, for example, is, is a spontaneous process. And these spontaneous processes that all of you can think of, you know that they're also irreversible. without external help, right? You drop your pencil on the floor, it's not going to spontaneously and reversibly come back up to your hand. However, someone else could pick it up or you could pick it up or who knows what, uh, you know, you got some levitating field, but there's some external process that's going to lift it to your hand. And we define entropy as the, well, characterization of the degree of irreversibility. And we'll come back to this at the end after you get an idea of the physical meaning of, of entropy. But we define entropy as the 
the heat that flows into the system going from state one to state two. Now, it's worth pointing out that these irreversible processes can be imagined as reversible if you can imagine being able to perform the transition in a quasi-static fashion. Any transition And by quasi-static, I mean, you imagine a very uh, slow, careful transition in which is in it. in which the, the system is in equilibrium at all times. So, you know, if you, if you have a, a, you know, a piston and you want to compress that piston, you can imagine, you know, having little minuscule grains of sand that you slowly drop on that and each one just slightly compresses it. So you never have a large uh, pressure gradient that has to be addressed. Now, we know that this is you know, entirely fictitious uh, to say that any transition can be uh, reversible, right? Because, you know, I can't imagine, you know, dropping my pencil on the floor in a reversible fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a construct that we're going to use that's going to allow us to investigate the nature of entropy. So let me draw a picture of a uh, system we want to imagine. This is going to be a system that allows for uh, adiabatic uh, interaction with the universe as well as uh, thermal. So this is our system and the system ha has some piston with some external pressure pushing it down. And then the system's in contact with a large thermal bath. So, we're able to uh, have the system in equilibrium with the universe uh, in terms of its pressure and its temperature. Now, inside the system, we have water. And we have a vapor. And in equilibrium, Temperature is a constant, and the pressure of the water in your system is equal to the external pressure. So with this ideal system, you can imagine uh, reducing the pressure Well, you're, you're pulling the plunger out, you're reducing the pressure. And in doing that, 
uh, water in the liquid form evaporates and becomes water in the vapor form. Right? You need that in order to have the pressures match. And when that happens, the uh, heat needs to be absorbed from the thermal bath in order to uh, allow for the uh, latent heat to, for the transition. Okay. And there's two ways this can happen. One, we could allow this to be a quasi-static transition. And if that's the case, then we're always in equilibrium with the external pressure. And the external pressure, of course, has to change, right? Because we are uh, changing the pressure. But nonetheless, we could, we could treat this as, as a, a very slowly changing quasi-static transition. Second, we can have a sudden transition. where we have a non-equilibrium. Situation. And in fact, if you do have a sudden transition, you'll have uh, uh, this delta P having a role, but also the uh, external external pressure will continue to play a role. So the work for evaporation would be P external minus delta P V. So this P external times V is the uh, quasi-static contribution, and this delta P is the sudden contribution. And it's worth pointing out that this PV cause delta PV is a magnitude And the uh, the sign is in the equation, and this is one element of the textbook that I think you need to pay attention to because it's part of what makes understanding these sections challenging is to to recognize that the uh, uh, the sign of the change in pressure is, is carried in the equation, not in the delta P. So we could take this and we could consider the inverse. We could consider applying a sudden pressure that would cause condensation of vapor into liquid. And that would be, have an external component. Plus the sudden component. And note here that the uh, sign difference is coming into play. And this means that if we took
the uh, you know the cyclic work, the work to go from say uh, one uh, uh, state out and back to the same state, we get a two delta PV because the the PXD are going to uh, go away with the uh, subtraction. Okay, well, that means that this is really what's driving the transformation. It also is, uh, and we'll see shortly here, is the uh, irreversible uh, work, the work that's transformed into heat. So let's continue here. Uh, now, what if, uh, what if delta P is equal to zero? Well, if delta P were equal to zero, uh, meaning the entire transition was quasi-static, uh, then the work would be uh, the ideal work. or the maximum work. And you'll see in a little bit, the reason we call it the maximum work is because uh, all of the work is work and none of it is transformed into heat. Now, to say that we've got this means that if we have W is equal to P X v minus delta p v we have the maximum work minus w i r so this term which is this that's the irreversible work This is the work that is lost, meaning that it transforms to heat, right? If you're pushing a block across the table, this is the friction. And you know that if you push the block from the left side of the table to the right side, you have friction. If you push it from the right side to the left side, you have friction. And at the end of the day, that heat then just sits in the room and, and causes the atoms to, to vibrate in the room. Uh, and you really never regain it when you, you cycle back. So, uh, using this, we can write the irreversible work is the maximum work, the ideal work, minus the total work. So this irreversible work, which is lost and transformed into heat, has to then go into our balance of heat, right? Some, some uh, energy term for heat, which we'll call QIR. And QIR is going to be Q rev minus Q. So this Q rev, this is our... Uh, Q ideal or uh, Q, you know, delta P equals zero. 
this is the the uh, heat you would see for a process uh, that was purely quasi-static. Uh, this Q, on the other hand, is the Q that we observe when we have a process that has both a quasi-static and a uh, irreversible term. In the same way, this W is the work that we observe when we have a quasi-static and a reversible term. So because the work that is lost as heat becomes heat, we have the ability to equate these. So now we've got a relationship between the work and the heat. So let's jump over here and let's first just consider evaporation. Right. If we have evaporation, now, what if it's reversible only? Well, then W max is P external times the volume. That makes sense. And Q rev is delta U plus W max, right? And, and that's just from what we know of uh, uh, delta U is equal to uh, DQ minus W, right? Our first law of thermodynamics. Okay. Uh, what about the entropy? Well, we want here. We want to talk about the entropy of the of the uh, the system and of the bath, and the entropy of the bath changes. That is Q rev over T. So what's happening here is we have minus because heat is flowing from the bath or out of the bath into the system. So the entropy of the bath is going to have a negative, and it's going to be the reversible heat divided by the temperature. That makes sense. The change in entropy of the system then is plus Q rev over T, plus, because the heat is flowing from the bath into the system. So the entropy of the system is increasing. And that's the only term. And if we consider the entirety of the universe, adding these two together, we get zero, right? So to say that a system is entirely reversible is to say that there's no change in the entropy as we cycle. You know, we're basically cycling. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, well, I guess this is just the condensation, so we're not even cycling it. But you'd see that if we cycled it, there would still be no, no change. OK, let's. Uh, Consider an irreversible path. 
Well, whoops. If we change from being reversible only to having an irreversible component as well, now W is equal to Px minus delta P B. All right, we saw that before. And now Q is equal to delta U plus W is equal to delta U plus P external minus delta P B. Okay, that's okay. That makes sense. Let's now talk about the entropy. Well, the bath again reduces entropy because heat is flowing from the bath into the system. And we said up here, we said up here that, you know, we've got the uh, uh, real work that's observed and the real heat flow that's observed. And then here we've broken them into their ideal components and their irreversible components. So what we're observing is the flow of heat from the bath into the system. The system, on the other hand, we have the heat that flows into the system, but now we also have another term where we have an irreversible contribution. And then this is coming from, this is coming from the uh, work. So we have heat that's coming about because work is being converted into heat. So the total These, those cancel out, and this is the resulting uh, change in the entropy for the total universe. Now, remember, we had right. We were able to say that from uh, up here. And we're still able to say that. Uh, we also have W. And simplifying that, putting the negative sign through, we get B delta P. Q. Okay. So now we have an expression for S tote and it's related to this irreversible work. So What's going on here? Well, we know V delta P is larger than zero, right? Again, going back to the beginning, this V delta P, this is a magnitude. The sign is in the equation, right? Which is why we're changing this sign. So if that's greater than zero, that means Q rev is greater than Q. So that means that the ideal heat flow is larger than the actual heat flow.
And that's because the work that's converted to heat stays in the system And that means that less heat is required from the bath. So that's one consequence of what we observed. And the other is that total entropy or the total change in entropy is positive. So this is uh, evaporation. Okay, now let's uh, draw a line here because I hate to, you know, you hate to waste paper even when it's not real paper. <laughs> it's a habit. Uh, so now let's let's move on and consider condensation, the reverse. Okay, we consider the reverse. We're not going to write out all of these details, but let's let's uh, just jump ahead and and talk about the entropy, right? Delta S of the heat bath in the irreversible situation is going to be plus Q over T. Okay, the change here is in the sign because oops, now. In the case of condensation, uh, heat's flowing from the system into the bath. So as the piston is being compressed, vapor is turning into liquid, energy is being given off. That energy in the form of heat uh, has to go somewhere to maintain constant temperature and it's getting absorbed into the you know, large uh, heat bath. And the system now also has a change in sign. You can see here, that's all positive. And here we put a negative sign out front. But aside from that, they stayed the same. Which means I can write this out as minus Q over T plus Q minus Q rev over T. I swap the order there to keep the, the plus sign. Now, the total change in entropy is Q over T minus Q over T plus Q minus Q rev over T. Those cancel, so we get delta S tote condensation is equal to Q minus Q rev over T. Okay, we still have Q rev minus Q is equal to W max minus W, which is equal to W max minus W max plus V 
delta p sign change, right? Because v delta p is just the magnitude. So the sign changes. And carrying this out, we get minus V delta P. Q, we have minus Q. Well, let's swap the order of that and change the sign to give us Q minus Q rev is equal to plus V delta P. And I swap the order so that that and that now have the same functional form. Okay, so one, this is greater than zero. So Q is greater than Q rev. Heat. The heat that's flowing into the heat bath that's actually flowing is larger than the heat if this were a perfect quasi-static system. And that's because we're compressing it, we're creating more energy, that extra energy has to go somewhere and it goes into the heat bath. Yep. The other thing that comes out of this is delta S tote is greater than zero again. OK, so what have we observed? Well, we observed that if you have a spontaneous process, then it's going to be driven by non-equilibrium situations. For example, our uh, having a pressure difference. And that pressure difference is going to lead to irreversible work that's lost not really lost, it's transformed. You know, you can tell that uh, the people doing this were mechanics people because they uh, think that uh, thermal energy is degraded from work. Uh, but it transforms from mechanical to, uh, or from work to uh, uh, heat. And if it's uh, quasi-static, which we know doesn't really exist, then we can create a situation where there is no change in the entropy. So we said the entropy was a, a measure of the irreversibility. So if something is 100% reversible, then it has no change in the entropy. Uh, however, if you do have a reversible component example here, then you wind up with a, uh, well, uh, the ability to, to measure this or compute it. And most importantly, this uh, entropy is going to be larger than zero. And you know, notice that the system we drew here, uh, this system, you know, this is the universe. So 
for a closed system, any process in a closed system that is spontaneous must be irreversible and must, must lead to an increase in the entropy. And it doesn't matter if you are expanding the gas or you're compressing the gas, you always wind up with an increase in the entropy. Uh, kind of an interesting observation is that this entropy is a state function. So we can use it to describe the, the state of the system. Uh, but unlike energy, entropy is not conserved. Ooh. Now, you can have situations in which delta S is equal to zero. But only when it's not spontaneous. So you have to have some external hand that comes in and jiggles it. And you know, you keep drawing your box, you know, larger and larger and larger. Uh, so you can include the hand inside that, and the, the hand that moves the hand that moves the you know widget on the table and the hand that moves the hand that moves the hand. You get the idea. You know, eventually, if you draw a box around the entire universe, uh, we can say that delta s equals zero. It can't happen, right? You have to have some external force, and that external force you then incorporate into the universe. But in in our systems, we can have this, and certainly. In theory, we can have this. What does it mean in theory? Well, what it means is it means that we have, and I mentioned this before, some sheet or some single valued function. And you know, we can move around on that single valued function, and we can always come back to the same point. That's an isoentropic function or an isoentropic surface. If we make another surface, say just slightly above it, and say we start here and we move and then we transition to that new surface and we keep coming around, we can never come back to that same surface because entropy is always increasing. And once you've moved from one surface to the next, you can't get back down to the lower. I mean, not within the universe, right? You can always have your system. I mean, it's like having a refrigerator. You can always have a refrigerator in which you are cooling something and you're pumping the heat you know, into the universe elsewhere. But within a closed system, it's always going to be increasing. And once you have uh, moved from one isoentropic surface to the next, you're not, you're not going to get back down to the uh, previous. So this is you know, the first couple of sections in chapter three of Gaskell. And I'd really like you to take the time. And it's not long. It's maybe three, four pages. Uh, I can tell you figuring out some of the tricks, for example, uh, you know, recognizing that PV is a, is a magnitude, knowing that's pretty important. <laughs> uh, and if you don't have that, you'll spend hours looking at this. Uh, but I think that I've given you enough of the uh, 
tips and tricks here to be able to read this section and uh, work on some of the problems. So uh, please do that and I will talk to you next time.